Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast which focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this is now the third episode of season four. I hope you're enjoying the new season so far. Thanks again to everyone who has gotten in touch with me over the last few weeks. I do love interacting with my audience. I'm actually interacting with my TikTok audience right now. If you're watching this on YouTube, I've got a little video off to the side of a live recording on TikTok. Shout out the 12 people watching on TikTok. <laughs> Another special shout out goes to Alex West on Instagram, who kindly made me aware that paracetamol and acetaminophen are different names for the same medication. In my recent Killer British Murder Stories collab with Bobby Holmes, we discussed the Chicago Tylenol murders, which involved the use of tampered Tylenol medication. Now, neither Bobby nor I realized that Tylenol also known as acetaminophen, hope I'm saying that right, is just another name for what we Brits call paracetamol. The more you live, the more you learn. Alex has kindly offered to help clarify anything medical for me in the future, so I will bear that in mind. Cheers, Alex. Time now for the opening icebreaker segment. Here's number one. Welcome to Daddy Facts. Okay, here we go. Dad facts, remember this, each week I read out a random dad fact from a pack of cards, just like this one, that my daughter got me a few years ago, therefore I've called it dad facts, that's what's the name on the card, or daddy facts, as my little girl just said there in the jingle. Here is this week's fact, first time I'm reading it, first time my TikTok audience is hearing it, first time you guys are hearing this as well. Ready for this? Be sure to rotate your car tyres every 6,000 miles, or after every oil change. This ensures the treads are worn evenly and helps prolong the life of your tyres. Another fact that will not save you in the jungle. One day we will get to one of those, but, you know, here's hoping. I can't remember any of them. There's definitely got to be one that saves you in the jungle. But we've done that. Now it's time for the second and final ice opening breaker segment of the show. The Serial Killer's Book of Haiku. Here is this week's haiku. Deep breath. <gasps> Tied, gagged, and shaking, her eyes white and pleading, I shoot her in the face. I mean, brutal. As a reminder, if anyone's wondering what the fuck I'm talking about, a haiku is a Japanese poem made up of 17 syllables in lines of five, seven, and five. It's also meant to be read in one breath, that's why I took a bit deep breath at the start. And this one is called The Serial Killer's Book of Haiku by Rose Bundy. There's a link in my bio if you are interested in buying that. But without further ado, let's get into this week's episode. Now this case was suggested by my listener Chris Condon. It's either Condon or Condon or Condone. I'm not sure. I should have probably confirmed with you, Chris, but let me know if I'm pronouncing it wrong. What Chris did was he sent an email to britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com. He asked me to cover two cases. I added them both to my season four episode list. And as a result, this season, season four, is made up entirely of user suggestions, listener suggestions, should I say. If you don't want a case to be covered and get a shout out on the podcast, please get in touch. You can send me an email, hit me up on Instagram on Twitter or any of my social medias. Now, as always, let's start with a look at the area where this story takes place. This week, we're in the East Sussex village of Duddleswell. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never heard of this place before. I kind of like the name. It's cute, isn't it? I tend to stay away from Wikipedia for my research, but I just had to highlight what it actually said on the page for Duddleswell on Wikipedia. It's probably the shortest wiki page in existence. It's just one line. It says, Duddleswell is a village in the Wealden district, East Sussex, in England, United Kingdom. It's as short as that. There's a picture of some tea rooms in the top right, but apart from that, I was pessimistic about what facts I could dig up for you about the place, if I'm honest. Now, to say I struggled finding anything for you would be an understatement. If you get a spare minute, just Google map Duddleswell. It's spelled D-U-D-D-L-E-S-W-E-L-L. -L. Change it to the satellite view so you can see all the buildings and stuff. You'll start to understand what I mean. There's literally nothing there. 
A few houses dotted around here and there, but it's just basically fields and greenland. I guess you would just expect that from a quaint little English village, but what it does have is a historic tea room. Now, we've got loads of these olden days cafes dotted around the country. For any international listeners, yes, we do have cafes dedicated to the drinking of English tea. Any Anglophiles listening right now, they're probably in their element, I would have thought. But here's a wee bit of history about Duddleswell Tea Rooms directly from their website, which is duddleswelltearooms.co.uk. They're not a sponsor. Feel free to send me some tea. It says the oldest part of the tea room, known as Fern Cottage, was shown on a detailed survey in 1658. I'm laughing as I read this because this is a true crime podcast. <laughs> the first occupant was Richard Miller, with no further records of occupants until 1809, when William and Sarah Trunk lived in the original cottage and had four children. This is the most benign story I've ever heard in my life about a tea room. I'll continue. Sarah died shortly after the birth of her fourth child and William remarried and went on to have a further six children with his second wife, Mary. Clearly a busy boy was William, very randy lad. In 1882, <laughs> I'm loving this. In 1882, John Coleman opened the tea rooms as a general store and eventually added the main house, which is now the tea rooms. Edward Scrace took over the business in 1935 with his wife and two kids. They introduced the post office, cream teas, they often rented out the old cottage as a bed and breakfast for passing tourists, and since 2006, the owners are brother and sister, John, Tanya. Now, <laughs> imagine you're a new listener, or a new watcher, and you're excited to listen to a true crime story, when in reality, you get a daft English lad from Yorkshire talking about the history of an English tea room. You can't make this shit up. This is what my show's like, and I'm not even sorry. I think it's time, though, that we do introduce the characters of this week's episode. We'll start with the villain, as we always do. David Shenery Wickens is his name, and he's been described as a United Spiritualists minister. As with most things, I had no clue what that meant, so I went ahead and did some digging. First of all, there's a religious charity named the Spiritualist National Union, or SNU for short, that supports spiritualist churches across the UK. Those who know me will understand my naivete because religion isn't something I study or believe in, but I'm always open to learning more about it. Spiritualism, if anyone is a spiritualist, please get in touch, but spiritualism appears to be a religion formed around the belief that people are able to communicate with the spirits of those who have passed on. So I take it from that that all mediums must therefore be spiritualists, I guess. Now United Spiritualists, of which David was a member, is a membership organisation that supports the work of affiliated mediums and ministers on their chosen pathways within spiritualism of spiritual communication or ministry. David was certainly of the belief that he could communicate with the spirits of the dead and on a separate and completely unrelated note, he also had an insatiable appetite for sex. More on that last point later. Let's now take a look at the other character in this story, David's wife, Diane Shenery Wickens. Diane worked as a makeup artist or designer, I think they're basically the same thing, on several British TV shows, including Legal Gentleman, Benny Dorm, Dead Ringers, Casualty, and The House of Elliot way back in 1992. For her work as a makeup artist on a TV miniseries named Arabian Nights, which aired in the year 2000, Diane, along with four of her colleagues, won a Primetime Emmy Award that year in the category Outstanding Makeup for a Miniseries, Movie or a Special. As with most things, I've never heard of this particular TV show, but it is rated 7.5 out of 10 on IMDb. I tried to find a link to it online, I could not find it anywhere. That's how good it is. You'd think there would be loads of background information about someone like Diane, but surprisingly there isn't. She did work for the BBC for around 20 years though, could tell you that much. According to IMDb, so she does have an IMDb page, she was born in 1959. David and Diane got married in 1997. They lived together in a cottage worth around half a million pounds, which isn't bad. Whilst Diane was busy making people look beautiful for television, David was getting busy in his own way. 
When it came to work, David helped out at the volunteer-led Lavender Line Railway, a small heritage railway based at Isfield Station near Uckfield in East Sussex, down south somewhere. It's about a 10-15 minute drive south of Duddleswell. His co-workers described him as being a stereotypically nice guy, nothing but pleasant, he always smiled, one of those guys. In his private life, however, it was a vastly different story. David was said to have consistently lied to his wife Diane throughout their marriage, and he was forever a financial burden on her as he was rarely employed. The railway gig, remember, was a volunteer thing. It appears as if the money Diane was making from her makeup gigs, I think she was on about 50 grand a year, it was sufficient enough to support the both of them. So David thought, fuck it, I'll just follow my spiritualist minister dream and not bother working a nine to five of my own. I mean, don't get me wrong, follow your dreams, people, but don't lie about what you're getting up to and just sponge off your partner who's doing something successful with her life. I found out while researching this case that David, whilst married to Diane, had slept with a minimum of six other women, and these weren't just one night stands. He lied to those women as well, and he'd tell each of them that they were his girlfriend and that he was divorced. One such woman named Kerry Lipper explained how David referred to her as his principal girlfriend, whatever that means, and would often ask each of his extramarital partners for money. With one of the women, David managed to leech a total of £21,000 from her over a period of years, all whilst doing the same things to other women that he was doing to Diane. Now you might think, how has he managed to swindle 21 grand out of someone? I mean, he was a pathological liar and a con man, and he had a son from a previous marriage. So what he did was he fabricated a story about his son having a severe brain injury, and as a result, he needed to spend a lot of time away from home to care for him, or so he said. In reality, that was just an excuse to get out of the house, get away from Diane, so that he could go and sleep with other women. Those other women, though, would be told the sob story about his son, and then they'd open up the purses in an attempt to help him cover the costs of his care. So this guy, married, says, oh, you know my son from my ex-wife? Yeah, he's, he's really ill. He's got a brain tumor or he's got a severe brain injury. I need to go see him. Is it all right? Yeah, you go see him. That's absolutely fine. So he gets his end away. And then the people who he's getting his end away with, he tells the same sob story to and they give him money. Hell of a business plan. It is an evil thing to do, of course. I mean, pretending your extremely unwell son is ill. As, as a father, it, it just baffles me. I just don't get it. Apparently, it wasn't just women he had sexual relationships with outside of his marriage either. But we'll come on to that a little bit later in the story. One of Diane's friends went on record saying that the pair had in fact ended their relationship in 2007 after 10 years of marriage. Despite allegedly both having new partners, the pair remained legally married and remained living in the cottage together, albeit estranged. As far as the background of David, Diane and their relationship, that about does it. So let's now move on to some events that took place in January and February of 2008. Now bear with me on this one, it's a very bizarre timeline in which I'll need to go over the events a couple of times. This is really juicy. On Thursday, January 24th, 2008, David phoned the police and reported Diane as being missing. When asked what the circumstances were, this is what David told them. He said that the pair had travelled up to London via train from West Sussex with the intention of Diane having a meeting with some of the BBC's higher-ups. Presumably it was in a relation to her being hired to work in the makeup department for a new TV series. Upon reaching England's capital city, David claimed they went their separate ways, which makes sense because she would need to attend the business meeting alone, and they planned to meet up later that day once the meeting had concluded. The meetup never happened. Diane was nowhere to be seen, and to miss a meeting like this with her husband, it was incredibly out of character for her. David attempted to phone Diane, as you obviously would, and left a voicemail on her answer machine which said, Hello darling, it's me. Wherever you are, just please get in contact. I'm trying to tune into you. You seem to be in not a good place, but I need to have some contact. I'm at home, our home, wishing you were here with me now. Please die. I'm going frantic here. Please phone me. I love you. Bye. 
The police took on board everything David had told them and started looking into Diane's disappearance. They first looked at Diane's phone records, which seemed to pinpoint to her being in London at the same time as David. No issues there. But what they did next really opened up the case and brought forward a whole new chain of events. After checking the CCTV at both train stations used by the couple to make the journey to London, it was revealed that David had in fact made the trip by himself. Diane was nowhere to be seen. David had made it all up about the meeting with the BBC, about them travelling to London together, then meeting up after the meeting. The case instantly upgraded at that point from a missing person inquiry to a murder investigation. On Friday, February 1st, 2008, David Shenery Wickens was arrested on the suspicion of Diane Shenery Wickens' murder. David was arrested because Diane hadn't been seen by anybody since January 23rd, 2008, nine days earlier. At the time of the arrest, no body had been found, hence David was only arrested on the suspicion of Diane's murder. Upon further investigation of Diane's phone, the police found several text messages that had been sent to some of her closest friends. One example read, I am on way to London, the number two, how is your cold? Die, kiss kiss. Why is that relevant? Because Diane's typical sign off on a text message would be Diane and not die. Die was what David called her. She didn't refer to herself as die to her friends. Interesting clue. It's a side note, by the way, but I never understood why people sign off with their name on text messages. Like, I've got your number saved as a contact mate. I know it's from you. Ironically though, as you can probably tell, these messages were sent from Diane's phone, but they were not sent from Diane. Despite all this circumstantial evidence, the police didn't yet have any forensic evidence linking David to the murder of Diane. And at that point, there was also the little hiccups of there still not being a body, despite it being a murder investigation. So what do you think the popo did next? Yep, they searched the couple's cottage in Duddleswell. It was there they found the tiniest little trinket box with a hidden compartment. Inside were a couple of rings that had blood spatter on them. The rings belonged to Diane, and you won't be surprised to hear that the blood was also Diane's. Whilst the blood spatter analysis had been going on in a forensics lab, the police had located some more CCTV footage of David. Dated January 23rd, 2008, the day before he reported Diane as missing, David was seen in a jewellery store in Tunbridge Wells, a town located 10 or so miles northwest of Duddleswell in the neighbouring county of Kent. What was he doing there? Selling some of Diane's possessions, of course, for the grand total of £100. Charming. Despite all the aforementioned evidence, it appears that David had to be let go until the police had more to work with. They sometimes do that. They let them go, but they keep their eye on them just while they build up a case to make it sort of concrete evidence when they do bring them back into custody. They can't ever let them go because they've got enough evidence. The investigation went cold until Diane's body was eventually found by a dog walker four months later in a thicket of brambles in a woodland area in Little Horstead. That's about a quarter of a mile away from the Lavender Line Railway where David was a volunteer. Next to Diane's body was a pair of her boots, which bizarrely still had shoe trees in them. A shoe tree is one of them things you can put in shoes or boots in order for them to keep the shape when you're not wearing them. You know, the things you push them in. You use them with leather boots. I've never used one, but you use them with leather boots, I think. Some footballers use them. Not me. The police looked at that and thought, well, whoever's put the body there must have put the boots there, must have had access to a house because it looked like the shoes have come straight off the shelf because they've still got the shoe trees in them. Who was the only key suspect that had direct access to Diane's house? To his house? David Shenery Wickens. On May 15th, 2008, David was again arrested, but this time he was formally charged with the murder of his wife, Diane. When he was cautioned, David remained completely calm, sipped on his cup of tea or coffee, I've seen the video, and simply confirmed that he understood what was being told to him during the cautioning. The really sad thing about this case is that due to the badly decomposed state of Diane's body, the forensic examiners were unable to figure out when she died, how she died, or even where she died. Now I wonder if the area where David left the body sees not much foot traffic, because I mean four months is a long time to be left undiscovered if she's only covered by a thicket of brambles. 
But working backwards, officers believe that the following chain of events are what ultimately led to David murdering his wife. On January 22nd, 2008, so that's two days before David's fabricated trip with Diane to London, and one day before David was seen selling Diane's possessions in a jeweler's in Kent, Diane was doing a usual check of the couple's phone bill and noticed two numbers that she didn't recognise. She did what I suppose anyone would do and dialed both numbers to see who was on the other end. The first call went through to a woman who turned out to be one of David's many lovers. Diane hung up immediately and dialed the second number. This time though, it didn't go through to a woman or a man. It was the number of a gay sex chat line. I bet you didn't see that one coming. The theory is that Diane then confronted David about the calls and the two got into an extremely heated argument which ended in tragedy when David killed Diane. After his arrest in May 2008, David was remanded in custody until his trial began in January 2009. Case prosecutor Philip Katz QC said the following in his opening statement. The veil was lifting from Diane's eyes and he had the clearest motive and the obvious opportunity to get rid of his wife. We say that he was solely concerned with himself. Mr Katz went on to say that the prosecution was not in a position to say when, how or where Diane was killed due to the level of decomposition of her body, though he did say this. It's clearly murder, and the evidence points to it having happened on the evening of January 22nd, 2008. With regards to what the prosecution thought happened once David had returned from the railway where he was working on the evening of the 22nd, Mr. Katz said, No doubt when the defendant returned home shortly afterwards, there was some sort of confrontation. The Crown says that the defendant, rather than see his deceitful life fall to pieces, killed Diane, his wife, and got rid of the body. He subsequently set about lying to the police and to the world. David, in an attempt to show his innocence, went down the route of slandering Diane and he tried to tarnish her reputation. He even said that Diane had actually manufactured her own disappearance. You can't make it up. What's most ridiculous to me is that during the trial, David explained to the jury that he couldn't have murdered Diane because murder was was against his spiritualist beliefs. He said, The principle is that you don't take life, any human life or your own life, and that you don't hurt people by words, actions or deeds. If I do, I know as a spiritualist medium what is waiting for me. It was revealed that the BBC had no record of Diane having a meeting on January 24th, obviously, and what's even more sickening is that when David left all those voicemails and sent the text messages from Diane's phone, he knew she was already dead. He'd killed her two days before, sending text messages to her mates to pretend that she's alive. Then he left the voicemail, crying down the phone, saying, I miss you and all this. What an evil bastard. The story changed that many times during the trial that it was hard for most to keep up with his lies. One such lie was that Diane was so ashamed to face up to her money troubles and their failed marriage that she wanted to start a new life in Spain, presumably without David. What's interesting about the trial is the witnesses that were called to the stand. One witness was a man whom David had called via the gay sex chat line on January 23rd, 2008, so that's the day after he killed Diane, but the day before he reported her as missing. That witness told the court that David had arranged for him to go round to the house, which he did, but that they didn't have sex. But why didn't they have sex? Because David opened the door in nothing but a white toweling robe, and the witness said he was not attracted to him. Imagine admitting that in court. Remember the £21,000 David managed to get from one of his extramarital lovers? Now, as much as he told her lies about his son, he also told her that he had prostate cancer, but that he was in good health. Another female witness told the jury that David had told her that he was divorcing his wife and selling their house. And both of those were clearly lies as well from Mr. Pathological Liar. After around six weeks, the jury retired and later returned with their verdict. They were unanimous in finding David guilty of the murder of his wife, Diane. On March 2nd, 2009, Mr. Justice Cook sentenced David Shenry Wickens to life imprisonment with a minimum term to serve of 18 years before being eligible for parole. After the sentencing, Diane's brother, Russell Wicken, who himself has been involved in British TV shows as a floor manager and first assistant director, 
made the following statement. Diane was a sweet, kind, thoughtful and loving woman. She did nothing to deserve her hate. The enormous scale of his deceptions we know now was matched only by his depravity. He betrayed everyone he met. He repaid Diane's unswerving love, loyalty and trust with lies, deception, cruel optimism and deceit. He embodies the shallow, self-serving nature of someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Detective Chief Inspector Steve Johns of Sussex Police's major crime branch said he was a charlatan who simply preyed on the vulnerable. They came across him at the wrong time, at the wrong place. He told them what they wanted to hear. And that was the story of British murderer David Shenery. Wickens. Thanks again to Chris Condon for suggesting this case. I'd also like to thank Kylie H for leaving British Murders a five star rating and review on Podchaser. Kylie said, Love this podcast. I'm a community carer and listen to this while I'm on my rounds. Easy to dip in and out of and has interesting stories that I haven't really heard about. Nice accent as well. And one of the few hosts who never annoys me. I'm glad I'm able to keep you company while you're doing your rounds, Kylie. If you would like to leave me a review, by you, I don't mean Kylie, she's left me one, you the listener. If you want to leave a review and have it read out on a future episode, you can do so on iTunes or Podchaser. I love hearing from my listeners and engaging with my audience. All reviews of the show help increase exposure, which is the key thing. Now, if you want to hear more on British Murders, check out all my social media channels on YouTube. I filmed this episode again if you're listening on audio, so you want to check it out on YouTube if you want. Merchandise can be purchased at Teespring. You can support the show on Patreon and buy me a coffee. You can email case suggestions via BritishMurdersPodcast at gmail.com or via social media. You not only get the episode covered, but you will get a cheeky shout out too. Also, what I've been trialing tonight is I've been streaming this podcast recording on TikTok. And if you're on the YouTube video, here you are. I don't know how you can see that because I've not got the video on. Hello, people. I've been recording this live on TikTok. If it's been enjoyed, who knows? I've not really read many of the comments, but it's a bit interactive. A little bit interactive. Do you know what I mean? So if you want to hop on, I might do more of these if it goes down well. But that's it for now. I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Until next time. Cheerio.